I'm very happy to be here. It's my first uh, live event uh, since a long time, so I'm very happy to be there, and especially with you, students, PhD students. It's, uh, it's, really, it's really a pleasure. So I've been given the task of uh, talking about nucleosynthesis uh, in the universe, and you will have to bear with me for three hours, uh, I hope. You will, uh, you will be happy and you will like it. It's not easy to, to cover the entire topic, even though in, even in three hours. And I have uh, selected a, a few things and I also tried to make the link between uh, chemistry, uh, physics and, and astrophysics. And I know some of you know much better than me in some of these fields, so don't be uh, shy to uh, to take the to speak and to say oh this is wrong or this is not um, precise enough okay i'm not susceptible actually i'm here to learn as you are okay so uh maybe i must say who i am a little bit or because you introduced yourself yesterday so maybe uh, that could be useful so i'm a professor uh, at the astronomy department of the university of geneva uh, which is famous because that's where uh, Michel Mayor and Didier Colos actually discovered, that's not where they discovered, but they were from here. Uh, it's famous for many other things actually also, nucleosynthesis and uh, galaxy evolution and things like that. Uh, but I guess most of you know the exoplanetary uh, people there. Um, I'm also a senior researcher at CNRS in Toulouse. I'm on leave uh, in Geneva now. And uh, I started my, I did my studies in Toulouse at uh, what was not yet IRAP, but at the Observatoire uh, Midi-Pyrénées. Uh, I did my thesis on uh, the production of lithium in the universe and the destruction of lithium in stars. Um, and then I went for a postdoc at Geneva University and came back to France, where I got my, my CNRS position. And I traveled around, I spent some time uh, in Baltimore at the Space Telescope Science Institute. We were discussing about that this morning. It's, uh, it's the amazing institute of the, of the Hubble Space Telescope and now the James Webb Space Telescope. And I've been some, spent some time also in, uh, in other places, uh, uh, Seattle uh, at the Institute for Nuclear Theory and, uh, and other places. Uh, and actually I was, uh, I think it was the first uh, uh, astrobiology school, so not the form it has now, but uh, the one in, in uh, Corsica as a student, actually it was a long time ago. I think I was still a student or maybe I had my, po my position uh, already. Uh, and uh, so it, it's a pleasure, it's a pleasure to be here a long time after that for uh, to give a lecture there. My task is to tell you about uh, where these elements uh, form, the, the chemical elements uh, uh, that you see here in this uh, periodic table. And I chosen this, uh, this one just on purpose, like if I was giving, giving a lecture in, uh, in front of people studying economics. And you see the description actually in the, in the table, you see the where the elements are, are used for. Uh, but you are not studying economics, you are studying science and I guess that maybe for you it speaks a little bit more uh, where the od ordinary matter comes from and uh, not so much about how we can use it here on Earth. So um, I'm going to discuss uh, this, this, uh, the origin of these elements and uh, what is uh, extremely fantastic is uh, to think that all the elements that you find in this beautiful tree or that you find in, uh, in minerals, in the baby eyes or in bacteria or in the universe, in these uh, large uh, scale uh, globular clusters or in galaxies, they actually formed the same way. And we are all made of the same ordinary baryonic matter, which is described here in, this, uh, in these tables. You probably all know that, but it's very important to remember that we are made of the same material, which was formed in the early universe and also uh, in stars, as we will see. So before starting, because I'm a little bit lazy person, if you have the possibility to screen this uh, QR code with your, and if it doesn't work, I will circulate the, the paper version. I would be very happy if you could take a few minutes, maybe do it by two or uh, individually, if you could take a few minutes just to answer to the few questions uh, that I have uh, asked in this, uh, in this questionnaire. Okay, so this is the, the plan of my, of my lectures. 
Uh, as I said, I will, I will briefly scan a few, a few points about chemistry, astrophysics and nuclear physics. Then I will talk about the stellar factories of the chemical elements. We'll give you a little bit of basics of chemical evolution. And then if I have time, I will talk about the special case of helium-3, which will lead us to the moon, as you will see. A little bit of history, actually, uh, in the ancient time, in, uh, in antiquity, there were already some uh, elements called metals that were, that were known. They are listed here. And all of them were actually uh, linked to, uh, to one, uh, one um, object of the solar system. Gold was, of course, related to the sun, silver to the moon, and you see the other elements were related, to, for example, iron to mercury, etc. So there was already some uh, connections between, uh, between uh, the metals, uh, the metals on Earth and, uh, and the space. Of course, the connections are very different now, uh, as we will see, but it was already a sign that uh, um, astronomy and, and uh, physics and chemistry were, were linked together. Um, at that time, also in the ancient Greece, uh, the concept of atoms was already set by, uh, by uh, Democrat and, uh, and Lysippus, who actually looked at uh, water, for example, and, and saw that you can actually recover the same water even if it has been frozen or if it has been evaporated. So that gave the concept that there was an element which was below this water actually, which was the, the link between the three different phases. And then uh, that uh, concept was uh, lo lost for some time, uh, uh, also uh, due to the, to the Greeks like Thales and Aristotle, who actually uh, suggested that uh, there were actually four fluids or called elements, which were underneath uh, every material and they called that earth, high, hair, fire, water and, uh, and uh, ether for what was going out, for what was outside the earth actually in, uh, in space, in, uh, in the sky. And I said it was lost for some time, even though uh, in, uh, in the uh, mid uh, uh, eastern part of, of, uh, of uh, the world, there were actually uh, people working on uh, on uh, what was called alchemia, alchemia, which is the Egyptian art for, uh, for alchemy. And uh, you see also in these, in these graphics that actually these people, they were investigating how you can transform matter, but they were also working a lot on, uh, on um, uh, astronomy. So everything was linked. And there is actually a crater on the moon that has the name of this, of this person who was uh, uh, a chemist and, uh, and an astronomer at that time. This concept of atom was kind of lost and uh, when uh, in, uh, in uh, Europe actually people started to, to do uh, science uh, uh, in the 18th century and starting to discover what was called element at that time, even though the people didn't know what that meant, an element, actually they could isolate some elements from uh, some gases, for example. We start to have a list of, of individual elements that were discovered by different techniques. And that led to the uh, renewal of this concept of uh, atomic theory by Dalton, actually, who saw that there was beneath each of these elements, there was only one atom, actually, a, a, a sphere, an atom, uh, which was, uh, which was uh, at the base of, uh, of the elements. And then the discovery of, of different of these elements went on through different techniques, uh, the, the advent of uh, the electrolysis and also of uh, spectro spectroscopy allowed to find uh, different elements to individualize them. If you want actually to, to do that yourself, you can practice. I found a very nice place uh, uh, on the web where you can do all this chemistry stuff. I guess for s most of you it's very easy and you have done that uh, in your studies. But uh, if you want to, to practice a little bit, you can uh, have a look at this and, and, and do it yourself in your own lab laboratory or in your own kitchen. So that led to the end of the 19th century to, the, the, to the, this periodic table. Here you have a, you have a written um, periodic table by, uh, men, written by Mendeley, Mendeleev, actually, which wrote this essay d'un système des éléments selon leur poids atomique et fonction chimique. So it was basically uh, putting the tables, in the, the elements in a system that was actually reproducing or interpreting their chemical properties. 
But it was at a time where we didn't know yet how these atoms were formed and it was actually eight years before the discovery of the electron it itself and almost 40 years before the discovery of the, of the nucleus, the positively uh, charged nucleus. So it's, it's really interesting to see that at that time you could do some chemistry and find some properties that you didn't know what they were related to. I would say this is the way science is is, uh, is doing actually, you, you find things and then you interpret later, but I think it's very, very interesting. And that was really the, the start of a very uh, interesting century. The, the, the 20th century actually was extremely interesting because then you had to discover all these things uh, below, below what was called the, the elements. So as I said, uh, there was a process to understand the, the atom itself. So we started with uh, the, this marble idea of, uh, of Dalton here. I'm a little bit embarrassed with, it. okay. So you have this, uh, the, this uh, sphere or this, this uh, marble piece, which was uh, called uh, the, the element. And then later on, so uh, the after the discovery of radioactivity, there was uh, uh, this uh, idea that actually an element might also not be stable, that you can have an element split it apart itself. And, uh, and then there was a discovery of, uh, of the electron by, uh, by uh, uh, Thomson uh, at the end of the, of the 19th century. So that gave this idea of uh, not a, a marble sphere anymore, but of a pudding where you will have uh, um, negative and positive uh, particles that would be in this, in this kind of pudding uh, called the element. Uh, and then it took some years still to uh, discover the, the nucleus, uh, which was uh, concentrating the, the positive charge that was made by Rutherford and Geiger and Martin. And the Nobel Prize also was given to Rutherford in chemistry for this. And then uh, Rutherford proposed this idea of, uh, of a nuclear uh, element where you would have a positive charge in the middle and the electrons going, uh, going around. Of course, this, uh, this concept uh, evolved with uh, quantum physics. And uh, for what is important for, uh, for this uh, lecture is that the neutron actually was discovered even much later uh, in 1931 uh, by uh, Shadwick, who also got the Nobel Prize in physics. And, it's, uh, and then later on, there was the discovery of the artificial radioactivity. So I think it's important to, remem to remember this, this uh, um, succession of events, actually, and to see how long it takes to understand, to, uh, how long it took to understand the, 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 the element itself and, and the nuclei and, and uh, its content. Then the physicists, they were actually also looking at the properties of, of these uh, nuclei, and uh, they found out that actually the, the, the mass of a nucleus is actually uh, lower than the mass of the separated neutrons that uh, compose this nucleus. This is what is called this uh, mass defect, which is here. And it was uh, related to, by Einstein, through the Einstein uh, theory to what is called uh, the, the binding energy, which is uh, given here. So you have this mass defect here. And uh, this binding energy is the energy which is required if you want to disassemble the, the, the nucleus into its constituent, but it's also the energy that was released when the nucleus formed through uh, fusion. And we will use this, this concept a little bit later in the, in the lecture. So here you have uh, this uh, binding energy, which is plotted here uh, as uh, this is the binding energy per nucleon. So you divide this quantity by uh, the, the mass number. And you see something which is very interesting and that you, you certainly know also, is that when you go to heavier elements, you go to more and more stable elements. And you have some uh, peaks in this binding energy, for example, carbon and oxygen which are uh, the multiples of, uh, of alpha. And what is also very important for this lecture is that the most stable nuclei, they are actually around iron. So it's iron and the iron group elements. And all these elements, as you will see, they can be formed by fusion. While when you go to uh, heavier elements, actually, uh, these, uh, these reactions uh, are, are uh, exothermic and and endothermic and you cannot form these elements through uh, fusion. So this is also something very important to remember when we will go to uh, the formation of these uh, very heavy elements.
So this uh, this uh, binding energy was uh, was extremely important, as I said, for the for the concepts of uh, of physics in general in, at that time, and it gave to Hans Petter the the idea that maybe in stars you could uh, you could fuse hydrogen into helium, and uh, you could get a lot of energy through this. So this is uh, what you can see here. So you have uh, two protons actually, which are going to give deuterium and then capture another proton to make helium-3. And with two helium-3, you will make uh, an helium-4. We will come back to that too. But what is important, if you take the mass of four protons and the mass of the nuclei, you have this mass uh, uh, defect here, and you see the energy release. So each time you produce an, an helium from uh, four protons, this is the amount of energy that you get. So it was very interesting, but it was also uh, understood at that time because of the, of the nuclear repulsion forces that you would need a very high temperature to make this particle fuse. And it was estimated by Hans Petter that this uh, temperature must be of the order of 15 million Kelvin. So again, if you want to practice, but with nuclear physics, it's a little bit more embarrassing. If you want to practice, you can go to this, uh, to this place here. And I'm showing you here, this was a toy that was actually uh, sold. You had some uh, radioactive elements <coughs> and an electron chamber, etc., and you could do it yourself. So uh, going back to, to chemistry, actually, uh, it, was, uh, it was also understood that uh, if you hit uh, if you hit matter, actually, and you put uh, a diffraction grating here, you could get this uh, very nice continuum, this uh, very nice arc-en-ciel uh, from light. And actually, uh, it was also understood that if you have the, the hot gas here going, uh, you can have actually some uh, emission uh, of, uh, of photons uh, uh, due to the uh, changes of the, elect of the, of the between bond levels uh, by the electrons here. So you could get the emission and doing that you could have actually identify uh, the, the chemical elements with their spectral signature. And then if you were doing the same thing but with the light going through a cold gas, you, you would get, so the same gas as here, you would get actually the absorption spectrum uh, where the, the, the photons are actually captured uh, at, different, uh, at different energy levels uh, related to the composition of the, of, the, of the gas itself. So you have this, uh, this uh, absorption. And if you are able at the laboratory to make this emission and compare to uh, what you see in nature or maybe you see in stars actually, you are able to identify the chemical elements which are actually composing the gas. So in the case of stars, and that was used very early uh, by uh, Fraunhofer uh, in the, at the end of the, of the 19th century, the idea is that if the star actually is very hot and emits a spectrum at, in the interior, when this, uh, this continuous spectrum is going through the cooler atmosphere, the uh, chemical elements of the cooler atmosphere, depending on the composition, they will actually capture some photons at, at specific wavelengths, and you would then, then get this, uh, this uh, absorption spectrum. So this was used very early, actually, to try to figure out if the stars were made out, out of the same material than the material that we find on Earth. And of course, as astronomers, this is the only way we have to understand the composition of, of stars, except if you have some meteorites or some, uh, some material that you can... Uh, but for the stars themselves, this is the, the technique that uh, we have to use, of course. This technique was used to look at the sun, as I said very early on. And uh, so this is one of the questions. Where was the helium discovered first? Was it in stars or was it on Earth? Helium is, comes from uh, uh, Helios. So it was uh, Janssen and Lockyer who uh, independently uh, looked at, uh, at the sun uh, during a solar eclipse and they found a line which was uh, unknown at the laboratory and this line they call it helium because it was discovered in, in the sun. And it's only, uh, it's only a few years later that actually this helium was isolated in, in, uh, in uh, uranium-based uh, minerals and uh, even later in uh, an oil well. So the, the geologues and the, the chemists can tell me if it's wrong or if it's not 
precise enough. Uh, and as you know, actually, this, uh, this element is, uh, is very rare on Earth. It comes from the disintegration of radioactive minerals. Uh, and uh, you can extract it from, uh, from different uh, 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 minerals. So it's very rare on Earth, but it's actually the second most abundant element in the universe. It was created at the beginning of the evolution of the universe, as we will see, but it's, it's the second most uh, abundant in the, in, the, in the universe. So using the spectrum here, you have uh, the, the Fraunhofer line, actually. So this is a solar spectrum. You, have, uh, you can actually look at these lines like that, and you can describe, determine the abundances of the elements, but you can also determine a lot of things about the star, depending on the broadening of the, of the, of the lines. You can find if the star is a dwarf or if it's a giant star, if it rotates, if you have uh, some splitting, you can also determine the magnetic field. If you have some emission lines, you can determine the mass loss. And if you look at, for example, galaxies, you can determine their redshift and how they actually, how far they are from, uh, from the observer. So this is a technique which is, of course, extremely important for, for astronomy. But actually, it's, uh, it's uh, usually people say you have theoreticians and observers. It, these are not different worlds actually because the observers who look at these lines and who then determine the abundances they have to go through very complex uh, models and here you have a, a schematic uh, view of a model of the atmosphere that you have to go through to uh, to to put on top of your of your data to determine actually all the all the properties that i mentioned before so when you get an abundance of an element from uh, from a uh, for, from a star it's never the actual measurement, it's really an interpretation on, on what is uh, in, the, in the spectrum through this model atmosphere, which is extremely complex because the atmosphere of stars are extremely complex. So out of this, we can find uh, what is the actual solar composition. And here you see that uh, on the left, you have the, the uh, hydrogen, which is the 75% uh, in mass in the sun, and helium is al almost 25%. And the rest is actually 0.1%. Uh, um, you have the others. So what the astronomers call others, these are metals. Everything which is heavier than hydrogen and helium, we call metals. And these metals, you can see here, split it on, on the right, uh, the relative mass fraction of these metals within the sun. And so you see that actually oxygen is uh, the most abundant of these, uh, of these metals. Then you have neon, uh, carbon, neon, nitrogen, and you see that iron actually is, uh, is a very modest uh, abundance. There is another way to determine the, the composition of the sun, is to look at the solar vibration. So this is a technique of asteroseismology. You have uh, the sun has a convective envelope, which is actually uh, throwing waves uh, within its interior. And when you look at uh, the, the, the sun in photometry, you see some light variations that you can interpret, interpret as a result of these waves uh, going through, uh, through the star, actually. And uh, through that, you can know to which depths the, the waves of different uh, lengths go. And you can deduce the density and also the composition of the interior of, uh, of the star. And through uh, asteroseismology, we can determine, so in the, in the sun, that uh, the helium mass fraction in the solar envelope is uh, around this, this value. So it's another way, extremely powerful way, to determine the composition also of stars. In the sun, it's very easy because uh, the, the helioseismology is, uh, is, uh, is easier to do. In, in other stars, it's a little bit more complicated, but it's uh, an additional uh, uh, tool to, to do these kind of things. Another way to to determine the composition of the sun, and we will hear uh, later this afternoon, much more than uh, I know <laughs> and that I can say this morning, is to look at, uh, at the meteorites. So uh, as I said, for the solar photosphere, you go through spectroscopy and it's strongly model dependent, so dependent on the model of your atmosphere. And in the case of meteorites, it's much more accurate uh, through uh, mass spectroscopy and you can, you can actually determine uh, the, the abundances. The problem is that, uh, of course, uh, there are some, uh, some noble gas and highly volat 
volatile gas which actually are depleted in the meteorites. But uh, as you can see here in this plot, which compares the uh, meteoritic uh, uh, abundances to the photospheric abundances, so it's in logarithm logarithmic scale, you see that apart from these elements, actually, there is an extremely good agreement uh, over uh, almost 10 orders of magnitude between the abundances that we determine, that people determine in the meteorites and the abundances that we determine uh, in, the, in the sun, in the, in the photosphere of the sun. There is an, another element which is uh, uh, different uh, uh, so in the, in the meteorites, actually, it's uh, more than two orders of magnitude higher. Uh, uh, in the meteorites, this is lithium. Lithium is an extremely fragile element which burns at quite low temperature, around 2.5 million K. So the sun formed with, uh, uh, with the meteoritic abundance, actually, but later on during its evolution, uh, there was some depletion of, uh, of lithium in the atmosphere which led to this composition. And this lithium is extremely important to understand how the, the magnetohydrodynamics of, uh, of the sun uh, because we need to transport this lithium from the envelope down to the interior and this is really an element which is, uh, which is strong constraints to this transport mechanism inside stars. So what we can get from that is that actually the protosolar uh, nebula, the protosolar cloud was very well mixed, uh, was very well mixed. So these are the patterns that uh, the, the most recent uh, abundances that were published uh, last year. So these are the, the photospheric abundances and you see interestingly some, uh, some patterns uh, in these abundances. So you see this is the, the abundances, they are here in logarithmic abundance where you take hydrogen equal to 12. So this is the, the reference element here, hydrogen equal to 12. And then when you go to, to the other elements, you can see the, the, the variation in the logarithmic scale. So you see again that hydrogen and helium are the most uh, abundant ones. Lithium and, uh, is strongly depleted. We have also uh, beryllium and, and boron, which are quite low abundances. And then you see these uh, very interesting patterns where you, you recognize carbon, oxygen, neon, magnesium, and maybe you already count that these are multiple of alpha and as we will see in a minute this is directly related to the to the nucleus uh, uh, property of the elements. What you see also is that iron stands out outside this uh, these, uh, iron group element and when you go to uh, heavier and heavier elements the abundance become really really minute and decrease by orders of magnitude. So uh, you remember this uh, binding energy uh, per nucleon curve that we had at the beginning where we could see these, uh, these peaks here. And uh, this is a, a plot that was made by Nikos Pranzos where you can on top look at these cosmic abundances. So in the sun and you see that actually the locally the cosmic abundances, so the abundances on the sun, they are actually related to the stability of the elements is directly related to the nuclear binding energy of the elements. And here you see the, the different alpha elements, also magic numbers, etc. So it was understood already in the 40s, by comparison of these kind of curves, that uh, the cosmic abundance, they were actually shaped by some nuclear processes, just by comparing these two curves. And as I said, it was established in the mid 40s, almost one century ago. And we tried to figure out where we can make these elements through nuclear reactions. So we knew from BET better that if you want to uh, have some nuclear fissions, you need to have very high temperature. And that at that time, there, were, there was a strong debate about, uh, uh, between two schools, those who sought uh, that you could make all the elements in the Big Bang. So remember, uh, Big Bang is of course only a theory and we are here uh, 30 years after uh, the discovery of uh, the, the redshift. So the fact that when you observe galaxies, the farther away they are, the, speed, the, the faster they actually uh, go away from you. And this, this gave 
rise to this big bang theory of the expansion of the of the universe actually that uh, at some time the universe was much more compact hotter denser and there was this idea by Gamow and, and other people that at that time where the universe was extremely hot and dense you can actually produce the elements all at that time and then there was another school led by oil uh, who proposed that actually the elements they were more they were made in the core of uh, of stars by thermonuclear reactions and these people were actually really fighting uh, to 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 defend both theory and then of course as usual they needed some observational evidence so at that time there were observations of, of globular clusters so here you have a sketch of, uh, of our galaxy and the small points that you have here these are globular clusters so these are very old clusters of stars almost as old as, as the galaxy 10 13 giga year and in these clusters we found some stars that had actually much less metals than the sun uh, and they were we found also in the halo of the of the galaxy wh when i say we of course it's the astronomers uh, they were they found uh, some uh, very metal poor uh, stars with very little uh, metals so this was embarrassing because that meant that if you had formed the metals in the big bang and then you see stars that have different abundances that was really a, a plus for the for the stellar uh, um, nucleosynthesis and then there was another evidence which was uh, really the clue uh, for this it was a discovery by uh, by Merrill uh, in a giant star of technetium which is an element that you find that has no stable form it has a, a, a lifetime I don't remember exactly the lifetime but the point is that if you were finding this element in a star and if you could age date this star which uh, at that time they had some ways to age date the stars, you, you were finding that the star was much older than the lifetime of this element. So that meant that if you could see the technetium in this star, then the star had to produce it itself. It had to be produced in situ. So these two, uh, these two uh, points, these two observations, gave rise to a new field which was called the nucleosynthesis. And there was this uh, seminal paper which uh, I encourage all, all of you to look at. Uh, it was written in, in the 50s and um, which describe actually all the ways you can have to form stars, to form elements uh, through nuclear reactions in stars. Both Gamow and Oil were right actually. Why? Because Gamow, if you, it depends if you take uh, the mass of the elements actually. Hydrogen and helium, they are the most abundant. So you could say everything was formed in the Big Bang, okay? And the rest, these are the metals. So in you, if you count in terms of the number of elements, then Hoyle was right because you produce many more elements. But in terms of mass, actually, that was, uh, that was Gamma who, who was right. Okay, so stellar factories. Uh, I will go through very basic uh, uh, ideas about stars. This is the sun. But you probably know that stars along their life, they evolve and go through very, very interesting phases and they undergo very, very interesting uh, processes. We will go through these, uh, these processes later on, but I already wanted to, you to enjoy these beautiful uh, uh, pictures of, of stars at different phases of their evolution. Also the stars, we know that they are formed in, in uh, uh, giant molecular clouds and most of the time they are formed in groups. You don't form a star alone, you actually form stars in clusters. And we see these clusters actually evolving and sometimes dissolving. Here you have the, the Arches cluster, which is a, a large number of, uh, of very massive stars. So my first question to you would be, why do stars shine? And don't be shy to tell me, why does a star shine? Come on, I nuclear synthesis inside of it. Nuclear synthesis, another idea. So you're right partly. It's like Gamow and Hoyle. Yes, it, it makes a lot of energy that makes Yes. Energy. Yes. So this is the reason why stars shine for a long time. But it's not the reason why they are shining. They're hot. They are hot. Yes. They are hot. 
you see? So it's the time where I present you my family, actually. And you see, actually, well, you probably have gone through these things over the two, two past years, you know, to get your temperature uh, uh, like this. So this is because they are hot, indeed. So here you have the, the spectrum of, uh, of the sun. So this is the, the energy flux that you have per unit of time and, uh, and, uh, and per unit of surface as a function of the wa wavelength. And you immediately recognize that, so the spectrum is in black, and you immediately recognize this the black body spectrum of the sun. And you know the Stefan Boltzmann, Winslow, etc., which uh, gives you the, the temperature of this black body through different, uh, different waves. And uh, if you want to determine the total energy flux of your star, you're going to integrate and you will get this, uh, this relationship with uh, the effective temperature, Tf, which is actually the temperature of the photosphere of your star, not the interior, but of the photosphere of the star, the, the layer where the photons ex escape. And to get the luminosity, the total luminosity, you have to integrate over the entire radius of uh, the entire surface of the sun. So this is how we can get the luminosity and the effective temperature together. So you see actually that uh, the hotter the surface, the higher the luminosity. So, of course, uh, you know that depending on your temperature, you're going to shine at different wavelengths. This is shown here. And um, so here you will have, uh, if you go to a, a very um, a massive star, which uh, has a surface temperature of this order, 15,000 K, this star will actually emit most in the UV. But if you go to a cool star, it will emit more in the infrared. Okay? And here you have the total sp the spectrum of the sun. Here you have Vega, for example, where you have very specific lines. And here you have a very cool uh, M-type star, which emits most in the infrared. And uh, here, humans, we emit at this, uh, this wavelength, roughly. So, but then why are the stars hot? And it's not the same reason I, why we humans are hot, actually. Except maybe at the end of your life where you start. Well, they are hot because they are just a sphere of gas. This gas is actually condensed because of gravity. So I'm, conf I'm a ball of gas confined by gravity. And what is this gas going to do? It tries to contract. Okay? So if you have only gravity and pressure, so the pressure is going to counteract this gravity. Uh, and this, here you have this equation, which is the second equation of stellar structure. So you see the astrophysicists, they have very simple equations. Uh, and it tells you that actually, uh, under the effect of, of gravity, the, 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 the star is uh, actually contracting, and you have the pressure that counterbalances that. And you see the stars, they are very stable, except at the very last fa phases, actually, but they are very stable. The sun is not changing that much. Of course, there are nuclear reactions, so it, it's a little bit different. But, uh, but you see that you can shine just because you are a ball of gas contracting. Okay? And with this very simple equation, you can actually find the pressure at the, at the center of the sun. And you can also, if you take an equation of state, perfect gas, you can determine like this, the temperature at the center of the sun, and you will find something of the order of 20 million K. So if you do the exercise, uh, find again these, these uh, different equations, and you can, by knowing the mass and the radius of the sun, you can determine the temperature at the center. Pretty easy. This is what they have done, actually, better. And, uh, and whole. Okay? So in the sun, actually, the temperature is of the order of 15 million K, so by this very rough exercise, you can find the, the, the the right order of magnitude. Okay, so the star is in a hydrostatic equilibrium. And uh, of course, if there is a gradient of pressure, there will be also a gradient of temperature. And if you have a gradient of temperature, the particles inside the, 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 the star will actually, and in particular the, the photons, they will actually move uh, through diffusive processes. It will take quite some time, but then you can actually uh, transport the photons from the center to, to the outside with this very simple diffusion equation. The star shines because it's hot and also especially because it's hot. You have a, a, a gradient of, of temperature inside which is imposed by the gravity. 
okay? Uh, and what is very interesting, actually, and very important, that is that you can find that the luminosity of the star, through these very simple uh, equations, is proportional to the mass with this uh, exponent here, 3.5. And you don't need to, to, to do that, you don't need to have any assumption about nuclear reactions. You can find this, uh, this relation by observations. So here you have actually the, the luminosity uh, the luminosity of different stars as a function of mass. And uh, here in this case, the, these are stars that were in, uh, in, um, in binaries. So it's easier to determine the mass of the star in binaries. And also we knew the distance through parallax, precise parallaxes. So here the, you see the error bars are quite small and you find this beautiful uh, correlation between luminosity and mass. So if you remember only one thing out of my lecture is that mass matters. Okay. The hotter you are, the brightest you are. But if you look at, if you compare actually the sun, so this is the power of the sun and uh, it's what you actually, uh, the, the 100 watt is what you actually, uh, the, your own power. If you eat, for example, uh, 25 apples a day, etc. This is the comparison with the calories. And then if you compare the mass, this is the mass of the sun, this is the mass, uh, rough mass of humans. And then if you compare actually the luminosity per mass, we are extremely more powerful than uh, stars after all. It can shine just because of gravity, but how long can it shine through gravity? So if you want to determine how long it will last, you can use this Virial theorem and find that actually half of the energy which is liberated by contraction, the gravitational energy, will be used to heat the star. So when the star contracts, the gas uh, becomes hotter and half of this gravitational energy is radiative, uh, radiated away. So uh, in the case of an ideal gas, you have this relationship between the luminosity, the internal energy and the gravitational energy. And uh, the time you can shine with only this uh, contraction is given here. So it's the internal energy divided by luminosity or the epsilon graph divided by 2L because you have the two here. And you get this, uh, this quantity, which gives you for the case of the sun, this value of 15 million years. Okay, so if you are just contracting like that, the sun can last for 15 million years. If I turn off the nuclear reactions, it will stay like it is now for 15 million years. Uh, okay, but of course, if you want the, the stars to shine uh, for longer, you need an additional energy source, and this is where you were right, actually. Okay, so uh, now if you compare this uh, Kelvin uh, uh, quantity, which was actually determined uh, at the end of the 19th century, huh, this, uh, this, uh, this age, you all know actually better than me that there are there were ways also to de determine the, the the age of the Earth and actually uh, Kelvin also computed this uh, this value, but he was wrong uh, because it didn't account for the for the um, radioactivity and for other reasons also I think he didn't use convection in his uh, uh, model of the Earth etc. Uh, but at that time, it was okay to find these uh, two quantities like that because uh, it was okay with the, the Laplace hypothesis that the protosolar nebula and the, the Earth actually, they formed at the same time. So these quantities agreed, but it was by pure wrong coincidence that they were agreeing. And of course, this was very early on in conflict with geology and with uh, Darwin observations. And it's thanks to uh, radioactivity that things could be uh, uh, put together. Uh, so radioactivity also uh, gave this idea of this additional heat uh, source inside, the, inside the, the Earth. And it was used also to age date the meteorites and to find this, uh, this age of 4.5 giga year for, for the sun and also for, for the meteorites. By the way, uh, this is the only star for which we know the age, actually. The sun is the only star for which we know the age. So when we derive the ages of stars, we go through models which are extremely complicated because there is a lot of hydrodynamics, nuclear stuff, etc. So we do these models and then we say, 
out of what we know from the Sun, we extrapolate with our models to determine the age of other stars. So this uh, agrees pretty well with the age of the oldest uh, rocks uh, on Earth, and it's also uh, agreeing very well with the age uh, of, uh, of the Moon. So if we want the stars to last uh, longer, uh, we need to have this, uh, this other thing that better proposed, so this uh, hydrogen burning to helium. And uh, in order to compute this, uh, you can get the, the nuclear energy that you, you will actually get from, uh, from the uh, Einstein equation here. Uh, and here you need to know how much, what fraction of the star you're going to fuse. So in the case of, because you have this very strong gradient of temperature, the nuclear reactions, they actually occur only in the core of the sun and not everywhere. So you are going to burn something like 10% of the, of the hydrogen in the core. And here you get the amount of, uh, of uh, uh, energy that you get for, for one, uh, one fusion. And at the end of the day, if you compute, you get this nuclear time scale, which is actually proportional to the mass and inversely proportional to the luminosity of the star. And if you actually remember this relationship, you get that the lifetime of a star through, it, through which is actually burning hydrogen into helium. And you will see this is the longest phase of nucleosynthesis uh, in, uh, in stars. You get this quantity for the sun, so roughly 10 giga year, meaning that we are, the sun is at the mid of its life. But you see that it's a little bit counterintuitive, but uh, the more massive the star, the shorter its lifetime, okay? Just because it's so luminous, that it has to, to compensate this, this gravity. And to do that, it has to, the, the nuclear phases have to accelerate inside. And actually, you see that for a, a star which has uh, one tenth of the mass of the sun, it, it lasts uh, much longer than the age of the universe. And if you look at the 60 solar mass star, it lasts only 3 million years. OK, so here again, mass matters. The more massive you are, the faster you're going to die if you are a star. So I'm going to compare a, a couple of, of uh, lifetimes. So I spoke about the Kelvin Elmholtz, the nuclear lifetime, and now I'm just going to mention the free fall time. So imagine at the, f at the time you don't have nuclear reactions and you have no more way to compensate the gravity. So you remove the pressure, you have this uh, free fall time, which is, uh, which is given by this, uh, by this expression here. And you get that if you remove nuclear reactions, if you remove the, the, the pressure, your star is going to collapse very quickly. OK, so it's not going to happen in the sun, but in some stars you have this three fold time scale, which is going to be important. So if you remember this, uh, this time scale, the longest time scale is this nuclear time scale, much longer than the Kelvin Elmholtz, which is also much longer than the three fold time scale. And what is important is that actually, the, the luminosity of the star doesn't adjust to the nuclear reaction. It's the opposite. So because the star has a mass, it has a, a gradient of temperature, a certain temperature inside, and then the nuclear reactions will adjust to that. OK, so what about now uh, the interior? So we spoke about the sun, the temperature inside the sun. And here in this plot, you have uh, the temperatures in logarithm at the center of stars. So these are models stellar evolution models, uh, where you see the temperature, the central temperature versus the central density. And each of these uh, lines here is uh, the evolution of, the, of these quantities inside a, a model of stars of different masses. So you have 0.8, 1, 1.35, up to 120 solar masses. OK, so we go from the low mass stars to the massive stars here. And you see that the more massive the star, so the beginning is here of the evolution. Uh, and you see that the more massive the star, the hottest and the densest the core is. So the stars, they will move like this because the core is actually always contracting a little bit. So you will actually move to this direction where you will see the density and the temperature increasing all along the evolution of the stars. And here during this phase here, you will burn hydrogen then there will be no hydrogen Im anymore. The star will contract, zoops, go to helium burning, and then zoops, go to carbon burning, eventually, if you are a massive star. 
Okay, if you are a massive star, you go through all these phases of nuclear synthesis that I will detail later. But you see that the more massive you are, the further you can go. Now, if you are a low mass star, you have a problem because at the end of the evolution, you see that you enter this uh, very uh, this region, which is actually the region. So what I forgot to say is that here, in the case of massive stars, you are always you can always consider that you are you have an ideal gas. But when you go to the low mass stars, at some point, you will have the degeneracy, electronic degeneracy that will happen. So in this case, you will have when the, 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 the core contracts, you will have these poor electrons that will have, you know, to, to fight with each other and to align in the, in the different levels. And this will actually give the pressure to your star. This is a state of a white dwarf. Actually. So when you are a low mass star, at a certain point, you enter these very uh, scary regions where you have this degeneracy and you cannot go further on in the evolution. You cannot do this nuclear burning uh, easily. So again, mass matters for this reason. If you are a small star like the Sun, you will go through these phases that we will see later. So you will go through the red giant phase. At the end of your evolution, you will become a beautiful planetary nebula. And then you will end up with a white, as a white dwarf with the core being these degenerate electrons, carbon and oxygen. Now, if you are a massive star, you will go through the red supergiant. You will eventually explode, eventually as a supernova, and the, remain the, the, the remnant will be either a neutron star or a black hole. This is, a, this is a, a movie that was made. So Gaia is a satellite you probably heard of, which is actually looking at the distances of, uh, of stars in the galaxy. So the idea is to make a 3D uh, vision of the galaxy. And here what you see in this plot is that these are stars. This is the number of stars that you have and uh, which have different colors. And because we know very well their distances, we are able to determine their, their luminosity. And you see that the stars, when you do that, you, you plot them. Uh, so this is the luminosity here, and this is the color here. And you see that the stars that were taken randomly, actually they align for this beautiful diagram. So again, luminosity versus color. And color means temperature. So remember, if you are red, you are cool. And if you are hot, if you are blue, you are hot. OK, so you go from, uh, from uh, cool stars to uh, hot stars. And you go actually from low mass stars to massive stars. So this is one of the most important diagram for, for stellar astrophysics. It's called the hersprung russell diagram. Uh, so here you have, again, the luminosity. The color, and here you, you have the effective temperature, so you go again to, to hotter uh, temperature on the left. And you see that if you take stars randomly, they align beautifully in different places of the diagram. They are not randomly uh, uh, in this uh, put in this diagram. They are really aligned in different phases. Uh, so what you see is that there is this beautiful here line, which we saw before in the movie, which is called the main sequence. And this is actually the, the line where the, we have this relationship between luminosity and mass with the uh, exponent 3.5. And you see, this is the time actually where the stars are spending most of their life. Why we see them here? It's just because they spent most of their time here. 90% of their life they will spend on this main sequence. And this is this central hydrogen burning phase. Okay. And then eventually, they will move to other places in the diagram. So if I'm the sun here, I will move here, come back here, and then go whoops, like this. So here you have also an accumulation of stars. It's because this is the second phase of nuclear burning. This is what we call the clumps. This is when the stars are actually burning helium at the center. And then you will move to other places and eventually become a white dwarf here, okay? So now we will see why the stars are going to move in this, uh, in this area. But remember that a star in this diagram stays there for 90% of its life and then starts to get around. Not in a stochastic way, it goes in this diagram with a very specific way. So the stars burn hydrogen for most of their life then they are going to contract again, burn something else, and move around in this HDR diagram. Change colors, change size, etc. That's funny. Huh? 
and then of course the dye. The first part you already heard about that actually, I'm talking a lot about this hydrogen burning. So this happens for different ways. So it's just making an helium out of four protons, but you can do it different ways. So in cool stars like the sun, uh, so stars with masses below a certain value, let's say 1.2, you actually do it this way. You actually take first two protons and you make, and you make a deuterium. This deuterium eventually capture a proton, make helium-3. And if you have two helium-3 around, then you can make an helium-4. And if you count, actually, and you're going to release two protons. So if you count, you put, uh, you put six protons and actually uh, you, get, uh, you get two protons out and you get one helium-4. And you can go through different phases. The helium-3 can eventually go capture an helium-4 and then make a beryllium, lithium, and, uh, and at the end of the day will make an helium. Okay, I'm not entering the details, but that's more or less what stars do. And in the case of the sun, the, the, it goes through this uh, path. Se Seventy percent of the nuclear reactions go through this path, and then the rest goes uh, in this direction. But the net result is the same as Better had uh, uh, computed. So you get you take four uh, you take four protons, you make uh, one helium, you release actually neutrinos, which was very important. Also neutrinos. You know the story that the neutrinos, uh, solar neutrinos, were lacking. I will show you something about that if I have time at the end of my lecture. So neutrinos, by counting the neutrinos, it also tells you the temperature. It's another way to, to determine the temperature at the center of, uh, of, uh, of the sun, because uh, depending on the path you actually go, you will get neutrinos from different paths, and that will tell you, that will quantify the, the, the temperature. Okay, that would tell you which reaction is favorite and, uh, and what is the temperature inside the sun. Um, now, if you are a more massive star, you, go, you can do it through what is called the CNO cycle. So this is four stars uh, that have temperature inside above 20 uh, million K. And uh, the, the idea is that now if you have some carbon, nitrogen and oxygen when the star is born, these uh, elements are going to capture protons and uh, at the end of the day they will actually make, I won't enter into too much into the details, but what you do is that, for example, you start from carbon-12, you capture one proton and you go through this process here, and if you count actually you have four protons ending in one, in one helium. And again, this is the same, uh, same net result. The energy that you get from uh, fusing four protons is, uh, is this quantity that we had before. So here in this uh, small movie, you can see on the right the evolution, a model of a star which is evolving on the main sequence. So this is a one solar mass star. So this is luminosity as a function of effective temperature. You remember the A-share diagram where we had uh, the stars aligning here. And you see that this one solar mass star actually evolves a little bit in this, uh, in this main sequence. So it really stays around here. And uh, this is here on the left, you can see the profile of hydrogen. So you start with something which is flat, the initial abundance. And as, uh, as time goes, you actually deplete hydrogen at the center. And at the same time, you produce helium. So helium is in green and you make helium at the center. Okay, so at, this, at the end of this phase, you end up with a helium core. Okay, but of course, helium uh, requires higher temperature to fuse with itself. So it, you need something like uh, 10 to the 8 uh, Kelvin. So in between the two phases, the core has to contract. And again, you have this phase of contraction that we were mentioning before. And if you are not massive enough to contract and reach this temperature, then you will finish an, as an helium white dwarf. But very long in the future, because these stars, they are very low masses and they are not at that stage yet, okay? But in the very uh, far future, people will find some helium uh, uh, white dwarf star. Okay, so what is interesting is that to do that, you actually uh, have the possibility to fuse two helium. You go through beryllium, which is unstable, and uh, you get an hel another helium-4, and you make carbon, so the, the, the most uh, the most abundant element that you will form is, is carbon-12. But this carbon-12, depending again on the temperature at the center of the star, so the more massive the star, the hotter it is. And in that case, this cap 
carbon-12 can also capture alpha particles and form oxygen-16. And here you have a list of other re reactions that can happen. So at the end of helium burning, you have carbon and oxygen. And if you are a low mass star, you will, stand, you will stop here and you will become a carbon-oxygen white dwarf. What is very important at that phase is that so here you see, the, you see the, the star and at the very, very center, so it's really a very compact core, you have the, the, the core which is burning helium and around that, because the surroundings have contracted too, so the surroundings where there was still some hydrogen, the surroundings are also contracting, hotting, and around the core, the helium burning core, you have a shell of hydrogen burning. Okay, so you have fusion in the core, helium fusion, and around you have hydrogen burning shell. And it's very important because in that case you have a very different structure of the star. This hydrogen fusion releases a lot of energy, which implies the star to inflate actually. So you have a very dense core which is contracting, and the star, because of this fusion in a very thin shell, is going to expand. So you have a red giant star cool at the surface, but inside you have this fusion. And this is where the star starts to move to the red part of the HDL diagram. Uh, so here you have the comparison. Uh, so this is the lifetime uh, as a function of initial mass of the star for hydrogen burning and here for helium burning. And you see that there is uh, more than one order of, it, there are two orders, uh, one order of magnitude difference between the hydrogen burning and the helium burning phase. We could say this is the end of the story for a low mass star because I'm going, this star is going to enter into the degeneracy regime and uh, it, will, it, will become, uh, it will become a white dwarf. And that's it. These poor low mass stars, they produce nothing else. But that's not true, actually. The low mass stars, they produce most of the heavy elements later in their evolution. And how can that be? So how can that be? When the star has finished to, to burn helium, it has a carbon and oxygen core. Okay? This core is degenerate, electronic uh, degeneracy, which actually counterbalance the effect of, of uh, gravity. And this, uh, this core is contracting and around it, the other regions where nuclear fusion has not occurred are also contracting and heating. So the star has actually two shells, a helium burning shell and a hydrogen burning shell. And you can see here, the so this is a comparison. So the, the core, which you see here, is really, really very tiny. Here you have the size of the star. It can reach uh, 500 times the radius of the, of the sun, while the core itself is only one-tenth of the radius of the sun. And what is very important, and I don't think I will go into too much details, is that in this phase, you have, you have this, uh, this thing which is happening. So here, it's, this is what we call a Kippenan diagram. So this is the center of the star would be here. The surface would be uh, very far away. And here we are just looking to this uh, um, outside the carbon oxygen core which is this uh, small thing that we were having here. And then we are looking at this region. So outside the carbon-oxygen core, you have this helium burning shell. And here you have the hydrogen burning shell. And what happens very regularly is that these two shells are going to contract. And because the uh, helium burning is actually extremely dependent on the temperature. It's, uh, the energy is uh, re um, related to the temperature with a power of 40. From time to time, you will have a, a flash that will occur to release this energy. So you have a runaway of nuclear reactions, helium nuclear reactions, which will lead to the development of, of a region which will go and extinguish the hydrogen burning shell. You will, have, you will have a mixture of, of different, uh, different elements. So in the hydrogen burning shell, you burn hydrogen as we have described before. And uh, in the helium burning shell, you produce carbon and oxygen. But when you have the helium flash, actually, you mix the products of this shell with the products of this one. 
and you engulf in particular a lot of nitrogen which was produced by a hydrogen burning shell and this nitrogen ca can capture alpha particle. It's very hot, you can do these things and then you're going to produce neon 22. Another thing which is interesting is that this neon 22 is going to capture also alpha particles and release some neutrons. You can do the same with carbon-13. You capture an alpha particle, you also release a, a neutron. And so your star at that time will be full of neutrons. And neutrons, they don't have to go through the, through the uh, nuclear barrier, actually. They can enter the nucleus, depending on their speed, actually. But you have a lot, a, a large flux, flux of, of neutrons, which will actually be captured by the iron peak elements. And this is where stars actually make these heavy elements through this neutron capture. At the end of their life, at, at the end of its life, the sun, when we, it will go through this phase, will actually produce a lot of neutrons and will produce many of these heavy elements. And actually the carbon and the oxygen that it has produced will stay in the white dwarf forever, so it's lost for uh, the enrichment of the galaxy. But it's really through this phase that the stars will really contaminate their surrounding. And this is where uh, I, I show you again this plot. You remember this, uh, this technetium uh, 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 spectrum. So this is when technetium is actually made, really at that phase. And it's an unstable element. And you see here, it's the same kind of star. You have barium, which is a heavy element too. And this is really through this phase that low mass stars actually produce these heavy elements. Also, these low mass stars, they have a lot, they are huge at that phase, they are red, they are huge, the atmosphere is cool, you have these strong pulses which go through and you have a lot of stuff going on in the atmosphere. And through these, uh, these, uh, oops, these shocks, you will be able actually to launch very strong winds. So here you can see in this beautiful image actually, you can see uh, the, the, the white dwarf is, is here and you see these circles actually which are probably related to these different pulses that the star has undergone inside which have launched this uh, very strong wind and you see this is at that phase that actually you lose a lot of, uh, of material. And here we can count the last pulse occurred 18 a uh, thousand years ago and it lasted for 200 years. And this is more or less what we find in the models depending on the mass of the star. And you can even see it live. You can even see some changes in the, in the wind or in the, in the surroundings of these kind of stars by looking at different times. And here you see this is uh, one of these famous AGB and you can see they are, it's observed at different, different times and you see the, the envelope is actually changing with time. And uh, you can quantify the amount of material which is lost at that phase. It's huge actually, 10 to the minus 4 solar masses per year. You may know that the solar wind, the, the sun loses 10 to the minus 14 solar, years per, uh, solar mass per year presently. So it's 10 order of, of magnitude higher. And this is also one of these beautiful uh, planetary nebulae where you have the, you can see here the traces of these uh, uh, pulses. And here you see the, the planetary nebulae at the end, the ejection through jets, etc. at the end of the evolution. So here in yellow, you can see these, uh, these low mass stars. So what we call low mass star is below eight solar masses. If you are below roughly eight solar masses, you will never go through something more exciting than carbon oxygen, uh, helium burning at the center and these pulses, which is already quite exciting, I would say. But and here in yellow, you can see the elements and the fraction of these elements, estimated fraction, which is produced during these phases. And you see that you populate uh, this, this part of, uh, of the diagram. So you produce through neutron capture, you produce these heavy elements in these low mass stars. OK. This is it if you are a single star and after the break you can see what happens if you are a double or in a binary. And I thank you for your attention for this part.